A huge thank you to everyone who checked out my last Spidey vid. The reception has been ridiculous and I seriously appreciate all of you. And with that positive reception came a lot of requests for my review on Spider-Man No Way Home. So this is gonna be your final spoiler warning. I will be fully diving into the plot and surprises from the film Spider-Man No Way Home. So turn back if you don't wanna be spoiled. All right, ready? Three, two, one, let's do this. Spider-Man No Way Home is a miracle. There is no reason that a film balancing this many characters, plot elements, villains, and Spider-Man should have worked this well, but here we are. And at the core of this success is a film that is celebrating not just Spider-Man's history as a franchise in relation to its audience, but a film that is celebrating Peter Parker as a character. And not just one Peter Parker, but we'll get there. There is so much I love about Spider-Man No Way Home, but at the top of that list are the ways it challenges Peter Parker. So I'm going to quickly talk about his arc through this trilogy, which I will relate back to later in the video. The MCU Spidey trilogy has largely been about a young Spider-Man finding his way as his own hero in a world that is already full of heroes. A world that fills Peter's head with preconceptions about what being a hero has to look like and the societal expectations that come with heroism in this world. In Spider-Man Homecoming, Peter is fixated on helping the Avengers and becoming a part of this larger superhero universe. He even starts to write off the idea of going to college in order to pursue heroism full time. The way the Avengers have imprinted their brand of heroism on society has largely dictated how this teenager understands heroism. He has his own moral code as established established in his introduction in Civil War, but with heroes like Iron Man being global icons, this sort of skews Peter's understanding of what it means to be a hero. This all comes to a head when Peter's mistakes have to be cleaned up by Iron Man himself. The consequences of these mistakes could have been absolutely dire if it weren't for the larger safety net of these other heroes, and it proved that Peter wasn't ready for primetime heroism. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it, okay? Which is why the final act of that film is so satisfying. Peter sticks to his moral code. He isn't worried about the big picture of heroism. He just cares about doing the right thing in the right moment. He stops Vulture without his Stark Tech suit. He doesn't save the day to a global audience that puts him on a pedestal. He just takes up the responsibility thrust upon him in a situation where he is the only one who can save the day. And because of it, he's offered that coveted place on the Avengers team to become the hero he thought he needed to be but rightfully, he turns it down. I'd rather just stay on the ground for a little while. Friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Somebody's gotta look out for the little guy, right? He's learned that this isn't what being a superhero is about. He can do the right thing without upending his life and becoming a full-time superhero soldier. Spider-Man Far From Home actually further explores these same ideas in a pretty brilliant way. After the death of Iron Man, there is all of a sudden this superhero power vacuum. While Peter has sort of figured out the type of hero he wanted to be back in Homecoming, the aftermath of Endgame basically thrust new expectations upon him. The idea that he needs to take up Iron Man's mantle and be a globally iconic superhero in the same vein. What is it like to take over from Tony Stark? There are some big shoes to fill. These are largely societal expectations, as the press focuses on these things when they interview Spidey at the beginning of the movie, but additionally, Tony gives Peter control over these Edith glasses that control Stark's global drone defense system. The combination of Tony handpicking Peter to control something so important, and these societal expectations for Peter to be the next Iron Man, completely shakes Peter's own perceptions of the kind of hero he needs to be. He learned in the previous film that he wasn't ready or even sure if he should be the type of icon that Tony was, and now all of a sudden, it's fully expected of him without his own real say in the matter. Which is what makes Mysterio's plan so effective. He looks like the type of hero that the world needs and expects. His abilities are reminiscent of Iron Man. He's got charisma. He makes a massively positive impression on the world. And Peter starts to think, this is what a hero looks like. Peter abandons his responsibility for two reasons. One, he wants to be a normal kid and have a normal life. And two, he doesn't think he can be the type of hero to take up that type of responsibility. The way society has made him see heroism makes him feel unworthy. He is, of course, wrong, and the ultimate lesson here is that Peter wasn't chosen for Edith because he's like Tony. He was chosen because of his moral code. He doesn't need to be the next Tony Stark. He needs to be Peter Parker. He saves the day not through Stark tech or massive public displays of heroism that we saw from Iron Man or Mysterio, but by using his spidey sense and stopping Beck from causing more destruction. But Peter skirting his responsibilities in Far From Home end up having massive consequences in his life as Beck unveils his 
identity to the world and frames him for his own murder. Which brings us to No Way Home. One of the core aspects of Spider-Man that we've seen through countless stories is the idea that by doing the right thing, Peter is the one who suffers. I love the way this film takes that to the extreme. It really anchors Peter to that moral code in some ways, while testing its limits in other ways. But I love that Peter's main concern is how it's unfairly hurting his friends. Yeah, he's bummed about how his own life is upended, but the injustice of Ned and MJ's lives being affected hurts him more. He specifically tries to fix things for Ned and MJ's sake, not just for himself. Peter, at his core, is a selfless person. Even if he loses his way sometimes, he's always anchored back to that responsibility to help others. Which is what makes the core conflict of this movie so great. After Doctor Strange's spell of forgetting goes awry, villains who know Peter Parker start getting pulled in from other universes, including the villains from the previous Spider-Man film series. This was just such a joy to watch. Seeing Molina's Doc Ock and Defoe's Green Goblin back on screen, and even interacting with each other, was a real treat. Jimmy Fox brought great new energy to Electro after lots of fans were disappointed with his portrayal in Amazing Spider-Man 2. And while Lizard and Sandman are sort of just CGI monsters, it was cool to see this many Spidey foes team up against him. But the conflict comes with Peter's realization that by sending these villains back to their home universes, he's also sending them to their deaths. And as I established, at his core, Peter is a selfless person. And even though these are villains, he feels obligated to help them. This is pure Peter Parker. He even fights Doctor Strange in order to do what he feels is the right thing. This idea is spurred on by May, who I'm happy to say was given a lot more to do in this film. While I liked Tomei in the role, it felt like she had sort of been relegated to the hot ant trope in the previous film. But I think the effort they made went a really long way this time around, showing May's work with Feast and establishing early that she is is one of the people who instilled this responsibility to help people into Peter. She's even there alongside Peter as they try to cure each villain of their ailments before sending them back to their worlds. But as I mentioned before, usually Peter is the one who suffers when he goes out of his way to do the right thing. And though he starts to succeed in helping these villains, it all goes awry, leading to May's tragic death. I think that making May this version of Peter's Uncle Ben was such a smart move for this film. Rather than shoehorn in a Ben who hasn't been established in these movies, we take the character who has been there all along and make it clear that she was always the one who had imbued this sense of responsibility into Peter. She was the one who helped push him to acknowledge the right thing to do was to help these people. And like Uncle Ben in the Raimi and Webb films, she was punished for doing the right thing. Holland's acting during May's death sequence is some of the best we've seen from him. And I think overall, this movie has his best Peter Parker performance. And this brings us to how the movie ultimately celebrates Peter Parker in the absolute best way possible with the return of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. The absolute magic act that they pulled off here is that these previous Peter Parkers positively did not feel like they were just included for fan service. The writers actually paid close attention to the characters' journeys in their own films. They felt like a real genuine extension of these alternate versions of Peter from the Raimi and Webb films with a natural continuation of their journeys. Tobey Maguire completely melts back into the role with an added sense of maturity. The last we saw his Peter was without a doubt one of the lowest points in that character's life, and Tobey rightfully wanted to keep the details about his post Spider-Man 3 life a little more vague, but they give enough details to satiate fans. Peter is still awkward and overly polite, but the newfound maturity he brings to the role goes such a long way. And more importantly, that added maturity is the future reflection that Tom Holland's Peter needs to see, and I'll touch more on that soon. Folks, I'm gonna be honest, I think the standout performance in this movie was Andrew Garfield. All three Peters did an incredible job, but Andrew nearly stole the show in what I can only describe as a vindicating performance. Andrew's time as Spidey was cut short in favor of the MCU version, and his films ended on such a tragic note with the death of Gwen Stacy. And this film not only feels like such a beautiful way to give closure to the character, but to the actor as well. The outpouring and love of support for Garfield after No Way Home has been one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And if you would have told me that hashtag make the amazing Spider-Man 3 would be trending on Twitter, I never would have believed you. I said it in my last Spidey video, but Andrew is the best actor to ever play Peter Parker, and the range of emotions he delivers in his limited time on screen in No Way Home absolutely proves this, as did his interview appearances over the past few months. It's Andrew Garfield playing Spider-Man again. No, 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 I'm not. Listen, listen, I would, I would have gotten a call by now, that's all okay. I'm saying. So I'm just really excited to see what happens in the third one, as you guys are. We say no. 
I'm trying to manage expectations. You say no. Oh, you say no. Yeah. I don't think any character made me laugh more in No Way Home than Andrew's Peter. His introduction was so charming and fun, but a single scene later, he was destroying me emotionally with his heartfelt performance. Maybe it's because I love the Gwen-Peter dynamic so much in those films, and the fact that Gwen's death guts me every single time I watch The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but the ways this film followed up Peter's grief and regret worked better than almost anything else for me. While this scene definitely seemed to draw inspiration from a similar scene in Into the Spider-Verse, I think the power in this first scene with all three Peters together is undeniable. Tom's Peter, having just lost May, now at his absolute lowest point, is met with two of the only people who could possibly know what he's feeling. But unlike Spider-Verse's Spider-People, we as an audience have actually experienced each and every piece of heartbreak alongside these characters. We watched Ben die, we saw Gwen fall, and we are now feeling the fresh wound of May's death alongside these Peters. This is without a doubt one of my favorite scenes in any Spider-Man movie. It's a single scene that showcases all of the collective grief and pain and loss that we have felt alongside Peter Parker. Toby's emotion in describing Ben's death all these years later hits hard, but not nearly as hard as Andrew's incredibly palpable grief from losing Gwen. The revelation that he went down a darker path after the events of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and that he's still reeling from his loss hits hard knowing we never got a follow-up. There's this moment where Andrew looks longingly at Peter and MJ as they sit together and it's just so damn heartbreaking. He sees what he had and he fears that he can never have it again. Which of course foreshadows one of the most cathartic moments in the entire film as Andrew's Peter saves MJ from falling to her death, stopping his younger Spidey brother from suffering the same tragic loss from which he's still reeling. I can't overstate how damn good Andrew is in this film. His inability to hide his emotions after saving MJ is just such a beautiful and touching moment. I kinda already said this, but I can't express enough how much I loved Garfield's performance here and the ways that the film tied up his loose threads. But even beyond this, the interactions between all three Peters are just such a joy to watch. Likening their newfound connection to a sort of brotherhood was such a smart move. While they all come from different worlds, to finally have somebody who truly understands the bizarrely unique life experience of becoming Spider-Man really does most closely relate to a sibling bond. Your siblings aren't exactly like you, but you've got shared experiences that nobody else can possibly understand. The trio sharing their own superhero experiences, sharing life advice, and even just being there for each other in ways they've never had, like Andrew cracking Toby's back. I don't know how anyone can deny the charm of these moments, or the charm of just seeing these three together. Toby literally hyping up Andrew and calling him amazing, which is obviously a play on his film titles, but also just sort of a fun way to reject the toxic infighting we see in the fandom about which Peter is best. There's a line that apparently Andrew improvised, where he tells both other Peters that he loves them, which is just a really cute and fun moment, but even beyond its immediate impact, it even feels like it represents Andrew's Peter perfectly, as his films focused a bit more on intense emotion than the other two trilogies. But the climax of the fight with these villains is, in my opinion, a real stroke of genius. After all three Peters work together and cure their foes, the MCU Peter goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Green Goblin, the man responsible for killing Aunt May. There is so much weight to the sequence, and they build to it so beautifully. Earlier in the film, Peter tells his alternate selves that he wants to kill Norman for what he did to May. When the trio teams up to find cures for everyone, there's this moment where Tom looks down uneasily at Toby's tools as he's about to make the anti-serum to cure Norman. And Toby knowingly says, we have to cure all of them. It's what we do. The maturity Toby brings to this Peter is so important in these moments. He knows and understands the grief that MCU Peter is feeling. He knows he doesn't want to help the person who killed May, but he acts as this older, wiser reflection of Peter who's there to reassure him that this is the right thing to do. MCU Peter's final showdown with Green Goblin is incredible on both a textual and metatextual level. In this massive event that feels like a culmination of every Spider-Man film they've made, you've got your youngest, most untested, shiny new Spidey facing off against the grizzled, weathered old villain that literally started it all. The villain who nearly killed Toby's Aunt May back in Spider-Man 1, and now came back 20 years later to finish the job in this alternate universe, to make his mark on a new generation. Peter lifts the glider up, the very glider that killed May, and he nearly becomes the thing that he is fighting against. He nearly betrays himself to give in to revenge, but that older, wiser reflection stops him. And brilliantly, this is a vital moment for both of these Peters. 
the older is given a second chance to undo one of his deepest regrets, stopping this very glider from once again piercing and killing Norman Osborn, from killing the father of his best friend, from setting into motion a series of events that would lead to pain, suffering, and even the death of that best friend. And in doing so, he is assuring that the younger might not have to go down that same path. He might not have to feel the regret of losing yourself to revenge. By looking through this alternate mirror into a potential future, he recognizes that he is betraying himself and he knows the type of hero he has to be. Peter knows that he has to be selfless and do the right thing. And this perfectly ties into the way that Peter's arc wraps up in this trilogy as he performs the ultimate selfless act to save the world. Peter has Doctor Strange make everybody forget who he is to prevent the multiverse from breaking open. What I love about this decision for Peter Parker is that it fully realizes what makes Peter his own type of hero in contrast to the other major players in the MCU and brings his arc full circle. In Homecoming, Peter realizes there's more to being a hero than getting called up to the big leagues. This continues in Far From Home where he realizes that he doesn't have to be the iconic Iron Man-like superhero that the world expects him to be. He doesn't need to answer to the expectations thrust upon him he just needs to answer to his responsibility. And in No Way Home, we see this in action as Peter makes that selfless sacrifice, a sacrifice that ultimately nobody knows he made. Taking on the absolute greatest responsibility, doing the right thing and being the hero the world needs to literally zero recognition. It was never about the spectacle of heroism. It was always about great responsibility. Now, I'm not going to claim that this film is perfect. The multiversal setup is a bit sweaty at times. When it comes to the magic, there are some aspects that simply don't make sense. Electro never learned that Peter was Spidey, so why is he here at all? Is everyone in every other universe going to forget all Peter Parkers? Why did these two Peter Parkers get sent back when they're just making people forget Peter Parker? Did, did they forget their own identities? Are their loved ones going to forget who Peter Parker is when they get back to their own worlds? If you think too hard about the magic, it starts to fall apart a bit, but ultimately, I don't think that matters. It's comic book logic, and it makes for the best, most meaningful ending for this Peter Parker. And that's the most important thing. Peter gives up literally everything for the good of the world. He's left with no friends, no family, no support. He has to sew his own homemade Spidey suit now. In one of the most telling details, he's even got a GED prep book, meaning that his entire high school career has been erased. He's gotta start from scratch if he wants to go to college, all while balancing a job to pay his rent and living his double life as Spider-Man. Sounds like Peter Parker to me. So let's talk about the future of Spider-Man, which now seems to have infinite possibilities. It seems like Sony and Marvel are intent on continuing Tom Holland's tenure as Spider-Man in the MCU, as you might expect after another billion dollar movie, and with a nearly blank slate, they could go a lot of places with his story. I'm eager to see what they're gonna do with that little piece of symbiote left behind by Venom in the post credits scene. Personally, I'd love to see them introduce Miles Morales. I've always liked the idea that in the MCU, Miles and Peter could actually be the same age because Peter blipped during Infinity War. If Miles didn't blip, we could actually get dual Spideys around the same age for the first time ever. Miles could be the first person Peter opens up to post forgetting. Peter would be more willing to let a fellow Spider-Man into his life than putting other people in danger. I really think that could be a fun angle, though I wouldn't expect it since the MCU likes to stagger their characters. I think we should probably probably expect Miles to be introduced when Peter is on his way out. But I'm also very curious what Sony is going to do with their weird little Spideyverse that they've built. They've obviously got the animated Spider-Verse films to look forward to, but with the Venom films being pretty successful and the ill-advised Morbius on the horizon, I expect they'll want to build on that in new ways. And I think they've likely got a pretty big opportunity after No Way Home, given the huge fan reception to the previous Spidey's return. Hell, they could just get Raimi back to straight up make Spider-Man 4 if the old team is up for it, but I think the most likely thing we'll see is the return of Andrew Garfield. I have a lot of dreams for these possibilities, but I think the most likely thing we'll see is a merger of Garfield's Spidey universe with the Venomverse. It feels like a no-brainer. Sony gets their own Spidey to play with while also making money with Holland in the MCU. Garfield gets to return to the role with huge fanfare and merge with a successful franchise. It just seems like the way it's gonna go. But Sony also owns Miles Morales, and given that Andrew's Peter seems to show a 
real knack for mentorship in his films and in No Way Home, it would be rad to see him take a young Miles under his wing in the Sonyverse. Or maybe they'll do the interdimensional romance between Andrew Peter and Spider-Gwen, though personally my dream is that this story would be a bittersweet romance that is ultimately about how both of these characters move on from their own grief. After all, chasing an alternate dimensional variant of your dead ex isn't the healthiest coping mechanism. Really, the possibilities here are kind of endless now, and I'm just eager to see how this all plays out. Speaking of bittersweet, one of my favorite bittersweet moments in No Way Home comes at the end of the film, when Peter nearly reintroduces himself to MJ and Ned before deciding against it. It's not subtle, but it's surprisingly powerful. The entire film, MJ has repeated her mantra about disappointment, and how expecting disappointment means you'll never actually be disappointed. But this time, she tells Peter that something feels different. She's hopeful. She's optimistic. Peter fears that by reintroducing himself into her life, this optimism could disappear. So Peter continues down his selfless path, and he lets MJ and Ned live their own lives. Excited to move to Boston and start at MIT, free of the difficulties Spider-Man would bring their lives. Spider-Man takes on his great responsibility alone. Folks, thanks so much for hearing me ramble about Spider-Man again. I love this character, and I hope you all enjoyed No Way Home as much as I did. Let me know if you want me to keep talking about this character, because I think I might dive into the animated shows next. Let me know what you want to hear. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more. Peace. Johnny! Two challenge!